in my book, I have President Obama talking to a number of very wealthy donors, uh, including Bill Gates. He says, in fact, there are five or six people in this room tonight who could determine, if not uh, who is elected president, at least who gets the major party nomination. Hi, I'm Raihan Salam. Today, Vice meets Ken Vogel, the author of Big Money and chief investigative reporter for Politico. Ken, tell us about Big Money. Big Money was my effort to sort of show this new political system that we see developing after uh, the Supreme Court decisions allowed unlimited political spending. We have all these major donors who are rushing in and having a huge impact on our politics. There are a lot of sort of easy stereotypes that evolve around these big donors, sort of their you know, Machiavellian interest, uh, their secretive nature. This was my effort to pull back the curtain, uh, show readers a little bit about who these big donors were, what motivated them, how this process worked, and what impact it's having on our politics, because it is a huge impact. Big money is about big money in politics. Uh, yet, I wonder, big money has been a part of politics for a very, very long time. So what you're suggesting in the book is that something new has happened, something has changed. Something very big has changed, and what's happened is that the big money has flowed from being controlled by and sort of harnessed by the political parties in a very organized way, by the establishment, if you will, to flowing outside of the party uh, to the point where it's controlled now by these sort of roving bands of operatives and the very wealthy donors who fund their projects and fund their initiatives. And even further than that, there are rogue donors who sort of branch out on their own who become huge political powers in their own right. So it's sort of the privatization of the big money. Uh, it's, it's going from inside a system that, while it had its many flaws, it sort of had some semblance of public accountability, the political party system that is, to outside the system, an increasingly secretive sort of shadow party system that now controls uh, politics by virtue of being able to harness this huge, unprecedented flow of money. So the money is both more. There is demonstrably more money, even if adjusted for cost of living and inflation. And then it's also being controlled less by the parties and more by these rogue billionaires. So when you talk about the political parties, uh, they used to exert this control. The money would be channeled through the political party. And there's a certain accountability there, partly because the party has a brand. The party doesn't want to damage that brand necessarily. And it's able to, let's say, exert some control over candidates. But my understanding is that the parties were actually weakened because generations of campaign finance reformers were actually trying to fix the system. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, that's right. A lot of people look towards these 2010 federal court decisions. The big one is the Supreme Court's Citizens United decision, and there were some subsequent ones. There were actually a few prior ones going back to like 2007 or so. But you make a very good point. This started, this, this evolution started before those. It started back in really 2002 when we saw the McCain-Feingold bill, and what this was hailed as like a great step forward in taking money out of politics, but it really had the opposite effect. What it did was limit the amount of big money that the parties, the political parties could take. They used to be able to take unlimited checks from individuals, unions, but take us corporations. Back a little bit. What were the problems that people thought uh, McCain-Feingold would solve. I mean, so you know, so back in the the 80s and 90s, what were the you know big problems that people had right. with the way campaign finance worked back then? I mean, they essentially thought that the political parties were being purchased by these wealthy individuals and corporations, and we saw manifestations of this. You know, I, I talk in the book a little bit about how. Anytime there's a significant reform in campaign finance and getting money out of politics, it's usually prompted by a big scandal. So you go back to like the robber barons in the well, late Watergate 1800s. was the Watergate, first big exactly. wave of campaign finance That's reform. That's sort of in the, the 70s. start of the modern campaign finance era. Since then, we've seen a few, uh, a few sort of incremental steps. But the next really big step was this 2002 McCain-Feingold bill. McCain-Feingold. I mean, this was a big deal because you know you have McCain, uh, you know, at the time a widely lauded. Republican presidential right. candidate. You've got Russ Feingold, who is considered a hero to a lot of progressives, working together on this big bill. It seemed, you know, like a very promising idea. It, it, it seemed like a promising idea, and even more than that, there was sort of a a public. Um, uh, sort of a, a public call, public demand for change because the system was seen as so corrupt. 
because these individuals and these corporations could essentially buy, you know, buy a plank in the party platform with these huge soft money contributions. So the manifestations that we really saw soft money, this, Ken? Soft money are these unlimited contributions that fall outside of the sort of the, what we call the hard money caps, where there are hard caps that are now $5,000 per candidate, per individual. Uh, is how because much they, they don't go to a candidate or an individual. They go to, say, a party committee. Right. So, and so the yeah. parties were able to get around these hard money caps with this soft money. Even spending. though soft money doesn't technically go to a candidate, I guess the concern right. might have been that it effectively is channeled. Absolutely, and, and so there was quite a bit of, of uh, public discomfort and sort of call for change because Bill Clinton was really the master of this, and it's interesting to sort of look forward to Hillary, who also, I think, was the master of uh, these sort of big money contributions that were made illegal by McCain-Feingold, are now legal again, but her husband during the, during the Clinton presidency would actually rent out the Lincoln bedroom to these big contributors who gave these huge soft money contributions to the Democratic National Committee. Well, they could get to sleep over in the White House in exchange for these huge contributions. And there was also a corporate side of this that was really sort of brought into stark relief by the Enron scandal uh, right right about the turn of the century. And uh, and so the combination of the Clinton scandal Because Enron was making substantial political contributions? Yeah, Enron was essentially gaming the system, and the thought was, the thinking was that they uh, sort of bought off, uh, to put it in a very pejorative way, uh, the regulators by giving these huge contributions to the folks who appointed the regulators, that is, governors, presidents, members and of Congress. And Enron was working in energy, so a very heavily regulated area where having that advantage, knowing politicians, having them on your side made a huge difference. Yeah, and then they were, the thinking was that they essentially gamed the system by using this soft money conduit to put all this money into, into the process and to buy influence, and that as a result, their um, irregularities were not flagged by uh, regulators who might have had an incentive to be less diligent in looking at them because these co the company had sort of bought influence with the folks who oversaw the oversight uh, regulators. Uh, so those were the sort of, uh, and there were some other scandals, but those were the two big scandals, the Clinton fundraising scandals and then Enron that really generated the public will, that generated the political will to pass McCain-Feingold. Well, fast forward eight years, the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court struck down key parts of McCain-Feingold. Even before Citizens United, it seems as though the McCain-Feingold regime started to unravel. Yeah, the McCain-Feingold law actually had sort of an unintended consequence that has really been the catalyst for a lot of the uh, evolution of the money from inside the system and outside the system that we've been talking about. Uh, by, by limiting the amount of money that the parties could take, banning them from taking these so-called soft money contributions, well, there were still big donors and corporations that wanted to inject huge sums of cash into the system. They couldn't go to the parties. They started looking for new vehicles outside of the party system into which they could inject this cash. Uh, some of the earlier vehicles were nonprofit corporations set up under the IRS under Section 527 of the IRS. Uh, in 2004, the first presidential election post McCain-Feingold, some of the most impactful spending was done by these quote 527 groups, including on the left, there were a few billionaires who in many ways were like the, the predecessors of this current mega donor craze that I, that I uh, write about. George Soros, the uh, billionaire financier, Peter Lewis, the recently deceased insurance uh, mogul, Progressive Insurance is his company. They spent around $200 million trying to defeat George Bush in 2004. And then on the other side of the ledger, there was the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth organization went very aggressively after John Kerry's military service, trying to raise questions about his Vietnam service and effectively undercut what otherwise was really regarded as a big strength for him. So. Uh, after the campaign, though, because there were still some of these laws in place that restricted how much money could be spent outside of the system, the Federal Election Commission and the Internal Revenue Service started poking around at some of this spending. Donors got subpoenas, it made folks uncomfortable, and so it kind of put the chill on this outside spending because there was a thought that, well, we could end up uh, sort of provoking the ire of the regulators. Fast forward to uh, 2010 with the Supreme Court's uh, Citizens United decision, got rid of a lot of those laws that the regulators would have used to uh, sort of scrutinize some of this outside spending. So it was really 
it, it was a free for all at that point, and that's where we are right now. So one thing I wonder about is when you're looking at that period in the mid 2000s, a lot of this anger uh, towards Bush, but then also you've got the people who were trying to defend him at the time. Um, it seems that it actually did a lot to shape our current politics. For example, uh, if you think about that Netroots movement, these progressives, uh, you know, who felt that the Democrats in D.C. weren't tough enough against George W. Bush, you know, that gave rise to Howard Dean, and then later you could say that gave rise to Barack Obama. So you know, you had that piece, but then even before Citizens United, you have the Tea Party movement. You have people who are saying that the establishment Republican Party is corrupt, it's not responsive to grassroots conservatives. So in a way you have in both parties that kind of anger against the party establishment and the party itself. So it seems as though that, you know, did that create this opportunity for other people to fill the vacuum? Absolutely, and the, the circumstances were right. You know, there was this groundswell on both sides. What there wasn't was this huge cash infusion that sort of allowed, uh, that sort of uh, once Citizens United happened and the cash started coming in, it channeled this grassroots uh, sentiment on both sides probably a little bit more on the right, at least initially, where some of these groups that for years had been spending money on sort of public policy advocacy, uh, small government advocacy, trying to reduce the size of government, reduce government spending, uh, they had been sort of functioning in this wonky realm where there weren't a lot of folks on the ground, regular voters who cared about this stuff. Suddenly with the Tea Party, there were, they became sort of the ground troops and then these People who pour decisions. money for these anti-establishment forces. Yeah, or or yeah. even more than money. I mean, they're always very wealthy people who are willing to spend money on that stuff, but there weren't the ground troops, the folks who would actually go out and vote based on them or knock on doors or make phone calls based on them. Now you had both. You had you had the uprising. Uh, you had pre-existing the upri the sort of popular sentiment. You had pre-existing the wealthy people willing to spend money. Then with the Supreme Court Citizens United decision and subsequent decisions, you had these new channels where they could spend this money directly on politics and give these people that were really interested suddenly uh, the sort of infrastructure that was necessary to go ahead and channel their enthusiasm and really have an impact in politics. So you had uh, you know, the kindling, uh, you had a little bit of a flame, and now you have the kerosene that you can throw on top of it so that suddenly these things could become real, you know, big deals. When you talk about money in politics, the names that come to mind first for a lot of people are the Koch brothers. Who are they and where do they fit into this landscape? So there's actually four Koch brothers, but the ones that we think of when we talk about the Koch brothers from a money and politics perspective are Charles and David Koch. They're uh, these billionaire industrialists whose uh, family owns, it's a privately held company, Koch Industries, and it does all manner of manufacturing, oil refining, chemicals, uh, really has its, its tentacles, if you will, and all manner of stuff that uh, frustrates liberals because it's really hard to boycott. But uh, for, for years and years, they had been involved in this sort of wonky academic space where they were libertarians, both uh, small L libertarians and big L libertarians. In fact, David Koch ran for vice president in 1980 on the Libertarian Party ticket. They campaign on abolishing the FBI. Yeah. Yeah, they wanted to uh, essentially strip uh, uh, a number of federal government agencies, including, interestingly, the Federal Election Commission, which was just getting its feet under it back then, and they uh, supported getting rid of all campaign contribution limits. So a little foreshadowing there, because now uh, they're spending a ton of money in politics you taking advantage in some ways of the Citizens United decision that allowed uh, big money to be spent in a more overtly political way. This is a shift for them. Uh, they, for years, have been more sort of on the academic side, you know, funding think tanks and funding organizations that did white papers. But they saw the Tea Party as an opportunity, I guess? Yeah, so a couple things happened. First of all, you know, much like the Tea Party folks, there's this sort of mischaracterization, I think, out there about like the Tea Party rose up in opposition to Obama. But as you suggested, in fact, the Tea Party uh, sort of groundswell started occurring during the latter years of the Bush administration when these mostly conservatives were upset with uh, what they saw as unchecked government spending. Well, so too were the Koch brothers upset with what they saw as runaway government spending under the Bush administration. And hearkening back to their libertarian roots, 
they saw the invasion of Iraq and our uh, military involvement in, in the Middle East as a major problem, a major waste of money, an ill-advised foreign policy move. So they were already kind of becoming dissatisfied, and they were sort of wondering about the impact of all this money that they had spent on think tanks, on white papers for the last 30 years. Well, what did it get them if here you finally had a Republican president with a Republican Congress, and they were engaging in all these big spending, sort of uh, world policeman-like activities that they thought to be anathema with their version of conservatism. So towards, actually towards the middle of the Bush administration, they started getting together these big donors twice a year at these donor summits um, where they would talk about how their money could be spent more effectively to change society, to advance their sort of small government, uh, limited spending, low taxation ideas, and they were increasingly sort of edging towards the more political involvement by the end of the Bush administration well, Obama was elected, the Tea Party groundswell occurred, and then we had the Citizens United decision, and they too, with your analogy about the kerosene being poured on the fire, that is applicable to the Cokes. They started spending, they and their donor network, and that's sort of a, a point that needs to be made, because it's not just them. Their power is that so many conservatives, wealthy conservatives, look to them as leaders on this, and they started channeling their money and their donor network's money into more overt political involvement, and now they have this huge network network of organizations that are sort of uh, pejoratively called the Coctopus uh, that, uh, that are engaged in, in elections from presidential down to like city council uh, in, in specific targeted races. And so liberals rightly see them as a real rising force, conservatives see them as well, uh, as a rising force in the Republican Party to the point where they are, when we talked about the shadow party, they are really the center of gravity in the conservative shadow party right now. Uh, so, is it fair to say that uh, the Kochs are essentially involved in political activity to enrich their own business interests and what have you? I mean, that's certainly a view that a lot of folks seem to have. Yeah, uh, I would challenge that view. I mean, there is, in fact, some overlap. And you, you, you say this of a number of donors, not just the Koch brothers. There is, in fact, some overlap between their political advocacy and the types of policies that they're pushing for and, you know, the types of candidates who they support, who they believe would enact those policies. Uh, and their bottom line interests. In other words, they have a huge manufacturing conglomerate. It does a lot of emitting. They wouldn't use the word polluting. Uh, and so they uh, are burdened by environmental regulations. They oppose environmental regulations. Do they oppose them because it crimps their bottom line, or do they oppose them because they see them as an impediment to, you know, to, uh, free, to uh, free enterprise really thriving and employing a lot of people, which is consistent with their sort of libertarian free enterprise ideas, it's tough to, for me, it's tough to do a chicken or the egg argument. Uh, I can, however, say that they have a number of sort of policy positions that don't directly line up with their bottom lines, uh, and that uh, they do seem to have been motivated, at least from my perspective, uh, in part, if not primarily, by this ideological, you know, this, these deeply held beliefs that they've had for a number of years. Uh, and uh, so I think it's a little bit of uh, a mischaracterization for liberals and others to suggest that they're doing this exclusively for their bottom line. Now, it also sounds as though, uh, you know, and, and you've written about this, uh, as though at least one of the Koch brothers has some views that are actually out of step with a lot of the candidates that. Uh, that he supports. Yeah, and this goes back to their sort of libertarian roots. Uh, you know, libertarians are in many ways closer on, on social and foreign policy issues to Democrats, to liberals, than, than they are to conservatives. Well, but tell us a bit about the views. In, sure, in so, so David Koch, I had the chance to chat with him briefly at the Republican National Convention. It's actually notable that he was a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 2012, because that suggests that there was an evolution from their libertarian days to now, where they have in some ways come closer to the party. Even still, though, when I chatted with him, I asked him about some of these views uh, that are sort of out of step that I had heard that he had, har that he had, had or harbored that were out of step with those of the Republican Party. I said, do you support gay marriage? Yes, I support gay marriage. Well, you know, the candidate in there in the hall right across the street, Mitt Romney, opposes gay marriage, and yet you're a delegate for, you know, his election. Well, I think he's wrong on that issue. Uh, military involvement in the Middle East, uh, Mitt Romney is sort of hawkish. How about you? I think that we're t spread too thin. I think that we should withdraw from the Middle East. Uh, yet another one where he's sort of out of step. I asked him about, uh, he, he was talking about the need to reduce government spending. And I said, would that apply to the military as well? He said, yes, it should apply across the board and 
this is the one that really sort of caught folks off guard. I think we even need to consider some revenue increases and that sort of code for tax increases. And you could see as he was as he was saying this and I was talking to him, his handlers sort of in the background like kind of like, uh-oh, you know. And a, and a few days later, they actually issued a press release that kind of clarified or attempted to, and from my perspective, sort of roll back some of his comments yeah. by suggesting that they were part of a broader policy prescription that he saw as uh, important to reducing our spending. But the Kochs weren't the only mega donors who were active uh, in the 2012 uh, race. Who were some of the others? Yeah, uh, Sheldon Adelson is one that is commonly cited as the sort of quintessential rogue billionaire. He's a Las Vegas casino mogul, Las Vegas Sands, the Venetian, his, his uh, companies. And uh, he spent $20 million supporting the presidential campaign of Newt Gingrich, who, you know, folks like us, political observers, would have realized and told him, go again, there's just no way in hell that Newt Gingrich is going to win the Republican nomination. And even if he did, there's no way he's going to be elected president. In fact, folks were telling Sheldon Adelson that, and they were urging him not to give because they rightly feared that any spending that uh, was done on Newt Gingrich's behalf could hurt Mitt Romney, who at that point was regarded, again, rightly, as the presumptive uh, Republican nominee. And if the primary was dragged out because some other candidate was able to uh, sort of throw a wrench into his coronation, then that would send Mitt Romney limping into the general election against Barack Obama. Well, Sheldon Adelson just completely ignored uh, all that advice. And it gets at sort of this dynamic that I think you see across these mega donors where these are guys who have been, I mean, they are mostly guys who have been extremely successful in whatever their chosen field of business has accumulated billions of dollars. And sometimes, oftentimes, and certainly in Sheldon Adelson's case, by bucking conventional wisdom. People told Sheldon Adelson, you know, Las Vegas is a gambling town. It's not about conventions. It's not about family travel. And he said, you know what? Screw you. I'm going to make a convention business out there. And he made billions. People told him, don't go into Macau, the uh, region of China where there's gaming. That's not high-end gaming. He went in there. He made billions. And so people telling him, don't support Newt Gingrich. He's got no chance. He thinks he's got the right. instinct. And so he thinks, I'm going to prove all these guys wrong again. So that, it actually backfires. So that leads to a larger thought, which is uh, that, yes, there's a huge amount of money being poured into the system. But to what extent uh, is it actually mega donors who are getting fleeced? Uh, you know, in 2012, you had these super PACs funded by billionaires and millionaires. Uh, and in some cases, it just seemed as though they were just bidding up the price of TV ads. Uh, they didn't get Mitt Romney elected president, certainly. Uh, and, you know, recently uh, we had uh, the House Majority Leader, Eric Cantor, Republican who is a tremendous fundraiser, spent enormous amounts of money to win a primary in his home district, and he gets beaten by a college professor who was barely spending any money at all. So, I mean, you know, how important is big money in actually determining political outcomes? I think it's, it's very important at the highest level to get candidates in the game. Uh, in other words, I don't think a presidential campaign uh, in 2016 or beyond can be run effectively with just sort of grassroots uh, activism and small donations, like what we saw, frankly, with President Obama in 2008, which you alluded to earlier. In fact, in my book, I have President Obama talking to a number of very wealthy donors, uh, including Bill Gates. Uh, and Steve Bomber, the, the Microsoft CEO who just uh, plunked down $2 billion for the Los Angeles Clippers. This is in 2012 during his presidential campaign. And he's, he's kind of bemoaning the, the state of campaign finance today. And he's saying, that I don't think a, another candidate will be able to w win the way I won in 2008, which was to come out without a lot of special interest, big money support, and sort of build that grassroots base. And then eventually he did, and he acknowledges he did, in fact, win some uh, big money support. Um, but he says, in the Citizens United age, that's not really possible. You now have this, uh, the possibility, he's talking to the donors, of 200 donors deciding who gets elected president every single time. And they kind of like, they're a little uncomfortable with this, my sources tell me. Uh, but he goes even further. He says, in fact, there are five or six people in this room tonight who could determine, if not uh, who is elected president, at least who gets the major party nomination goes even further, steps towards Gates. He says, in fact, Bill, you could just write a check that would swamp everything. And Gates is standing there. My source is telling me he's got his hands in his pockets. He's kind of looking at his feet uncomfortably. But this is, in fact, true. And it's an important distinction that Obama made, that these donors, these five or six donors in the room, could at least determine who would get the nomination, if not get elected president. 
And I think that this big money is Partly more important. Partly because you have billionaires on both sides, I right. guess. So, yeah. And this, this big money is more important in the primaries, where, especially presidential primaries, where you have the possibility, you have, first of all, you have the possibility of uh, sort of a candidate coming out of nowhere who doesn't necessarily have that platform and getting enough momentum to really sort of carry it through the process. And it's a longer process than Eric Cantor's primary. Uh, and then second of all, the primaries are where we had the battle for sort of the, the idea and the direction of the party. And this is where you have the potential for, because these are big donors sort of on both sides of the, you know, the Koch brothers side, the small government side, and then the Karl Rove side, the sort of more establishment country club Republican side, where they're really most willing to spend the money. Now, of course, as, as we talked about, it doesn't always buy results. In fact, we haven't seen it uh, buy results in, in the 2012 primary that I talked about, in Eric Cantor's primary. I wonder if that Eric Cantor primary is not a little bit of an anomaly. It certainly shows that big money doesn't always beat sort of grassroots sentiment, but that I'm still I'm still puzzled over that one. Yeah, and it's also interesting just because you mentioned Karl Rove. He, he's a guy who's done a tremendous job of raising huge amounts of money, yet he's on the opposite side on a lot of debates from the Cokes. So to some extent, I wonder if it's a kind of zero-sum thing where you've got, you know, big money on both sides. Yeah, it's big money fighting big money, and that's sort of uh, where we're at. That's the new normal. Karl Rove, you started to talk about the fleecing. Karl Rove is an example where he was, there were a lot of donors after 2012 when Karl Rove, and uh, he's, Karl Rove is the former George W. Bush advisor who really became sort of opposite the Kochs, the other shadow party boss in the, uh, in the Republican firmament. And uh, I had the battle between the Kochs and Karl Rove described to me by a Tea Party leader as gang warfare. <laughs> uh, but uh, Karl Rove, in his effort to compete with the Kochs and to compete with Democrats, was really spinning very hard these big donors who he has great relationships with, telling them like, we're gonna win, we're gonna beat Obama, all I need is that additional $5 million check from you and then we'll go into Pennsylvania and we'll put up ads there and it will tip Pennsylvania and then uh, Romney will have the electoral votes he needs to, to beat Obama. And you know, looking back on that in hindsight, there was no way that, uh, that they were gonna win Pennsylvania, that Romney was gonna win Pennsylvania. And a lot of the spinning that Karl Rove did about the sort of shifts in the polling was shown to be, again, with the benefit of hindsight, maybe some would even say it was shown to be at the time, to be totally flawed. And so there are a lot of big donors who wonder, hey, was Karl Rove, uh, you know, was he so misinformed that he actually believed what he was telling us? Or was he lying to us? Was he fleecing us, as you put it, to get us to write more checks? Either way, it doesn't redound to his benefit to have people thinking that. I have one last question for you, Ken. Uh, so you mentioned before uh, Steve Ballmer paying $2 billion for the LA Clippers. If he had decided to spend that money to buy uh, the next nominee of both major political parties, do you think that would be enough, $2 billion? Uh, I don't know now. I think in 2012 it might have been, but again, because we're really at the dawn of this new era, I think that there's going to be that the sums that were spent in 2012 are going to look quaint in you know three presidential elections in 12 years. So the question was put to me when when uh, when I was putting together this book, you know. Uh, Sheldon Adelson, you know, he's worth he's worth forty billion dollars now, and people are like, oh, he spent twenty million dollars trying to elect Newt Gingrich. That's so much money. But someone was like, well, if he's worth forty billion, why didn't he spend a billion dollars if he really believed in it? And I do wonder that, and I do think that it's a little bit better than shouting at your TV, which right. is what most of us do. I mean, it's it's essentially the equivalent. Uh, and and the answer that I came up with as to why he didn't was that some of the folks who were sort of trying to reason with him about how this would actually have a deleterious effect, a backlash on the party they may have gotten through, or uh, maybe it was just because it was so new and he's spending all this money, he felt some kind of hesitation. Either way, I see both of those potential impediments to the $2 billion uh, you know, independent expenditure by a Steve Ballmer type. I see both of those falling away in 2016 and 2020. So you may very well see, be able to answer that question about whether $2 billion could buy the presidential nomination. Thanks very much for joining us, Ken. Yeah, it was my pleasure.